So I'd like to introduce our next guest speaker, who is Rianne Van de Ven. Uh, Rianne has worked as a professional coach for gifted adults for more than 15 years. Uh, she is an author, speaker, trainer, teacher, and researcher on the subject of gifted adults and was the chair of the Gifted Adults Foundation in the Netherlands from 2013 to 2020. She is also an ECHA specialist in gifted education. She is a member of Mensa in the, in the Netherlands and a member of The Thousand, also known as the International Society for Philosophical Inquiry. Some of you may know it as ISPE. Um, you'll notice that I did not use the term doctor, and in this case, that's part of the story. Rianne was not identified as a gifted child and did not receive special guidance in her education. She dropped out of university without a degree, going on to have a successful career in corporate environments, telecoms, ICT, and banking. After the discovery of her high intelligence, 99th percentile, at the age of 33, Rianne dedicated her energy to improving the quality of life of gifted adults. She founded a social enterprise, her company Hugbefagd in Bedrift, meaning giftedness in operation, where she, together with 20 colleagues, helped gifted adults with career coaching and reintegrating to work after a period of sickness, commissioned by either their former employer or by the Dutch government. After introducing particular aspects of gifted education in the Netherlands, Rihanna will direct to turn her attention to qualities and difficulties related to gifted adults in their work environments. She draws on examples from her extensive work with gifted adults to identify common challenges and to discuss how to create opportunities for satisfaction in the workplace. This presentation promises to be an interesting and engaging examination of an under-researched topic, one that is sure to resonate with many participants. Rian? So thank you very much for that introduction and for inviting me here. I flew in a few days ago and I'm flying back tomorrow, but uh, I wanted to be here uh, present in real life very much. So thank you Mensa Foundation for this opportunity to speak. Um, I will also see if my machine will be working. So to give you a bit of context about what I'm going to talk about is I need to give you uh, some background information about gifted education in the Netherlands, the situation we are today. And I can tell you we are about 30 years behind of the developments in the United States. There were, when I was a child, no special education programs. They only came in the Netherlands starting in the 1990s maybe the year 2000, and they were not everywhere. They were basically based on individual teachers who had read something about it, who wanted to do something uh, for gifted children. So it was definitely not institutionalized. And even today, it is not a guarantee if you are a gifted child in the Netherlands that you will be identified at young age. We don't do standard IQ testing uh, there. So what we see happening there mainly is that a child gets into trouble, maybe has some behavioral problems, and then people start identifying what is wrong with this kid. <laughs> and then sometimes IQ tests are applied and then they say, wow, this is a gifted kid. And then they uh, start fulfilling those special educational needs we now all know gifted children um, uh, rely on. But it's definitely improving in the Netherlands and there are a lot of people and I really have to mention uh, them and some of them will probably be online at the moment, but people are uh, working really hard to get the situation better. And, um, but to give you the context, if I talk about gifted adults, well, none of them, almost none of them, were identified as a gifted child in the Netherlands. It's only today we have the first generation 
of um, people in their 20s, uh, in their early 20s, leaving university, um, entering the labor market that were identified as gifted children and had some of their specific educational needs met. Um, so, when we, uh, so when I talk about gifted adults, most of them were not identified. Then the question is, are they still gifted? <laughs> and that really depends on what theory of giftedness um, you like or uh, you follow. Uh, in my opinion, and that's uh, my personal opinion, but I think also that's why I give you this background information, um, the mainstream in uh, the Netherlands, uh, we mainly see giftedness as someone's potential. And whether it develops into success or results to be viewed by, uh, by the outside world, uh, that depends on a lot of factors. And what I'm going to talk about are um, the people that, or how they developed without gifted education being in place. So my personal story, well, was already a bit in the introduction. So yeah, I was a smart kid. And uh, I did uh, go uh, ending up uh, to university. And I was warmly, warmly supported by my family because I was the first in the family to go to university. And although they really supported me, I had no guide. I had no one telling me what I was about um, uh, to um, meet there, um, what I was going to expect, um, what I was going to be taught there. And to be honest, I was quite disappointed. I thought I would be amongst my peers. And um, I wasn't. <laughs> and so I, um, I went and did what I do have um, very successful uh, mentors or examples in my environment. And that is, I went to work. And um, I got identified as a high potential with the Swedish telecom uh, uh, company. Uh, Ericsson, I think there's also, it's also here in the US. Um, and they saw my talent and they wanted to help me develop uh, it. Later on, I went to a big bank in the Netherlands. I worked there in the ICT uh, division um, for over 16 uh, years. And there I met a colleague who had recently become a member of Mensa. Um, and he, uh, started to identify other gifted colleagues where he thought, you might want to look into this. And so I did, I got tested, scored in the 99th percentile. And I was shocked. For my self-image, I was completely shocked. How could I not have known this? Uh, so I became a member of Mensa, met other uh, gifted people my age, Man, did I love it there. That's where I met my peers. And um, uh, also, uh, two wonderful ladies started uh, the Gifted Adults Foundation in the Netherlands. I have to mention them here. Nox Nauta, she's been also speaking in the United States uh, uh, many, many times. And Maud van Thiel, who is also uh, the person behind the Delphi model of giftedness we created in the Netherlands. I must say, they created uh, in the Netherlands, and those are the giants on whose shoulder I stand. Um, after having volunteered for this foundation, um, I got the opportunity to, to become the chair, and um, I've been that up until 2020. Um, but then I wanted um, to elaborate more on uh, supporting gifted adults in their career. So I started this company, <laughs> I really liked uh, how Charlie just tried to pronounce it. Uh, in Dutch, it's called Hoogbegaafd in Bedrijf. Um, and it is, a, if I were to translate it into Dutch, uh, in, into English, sorry, um, 
it could have several meanings, and that's exactly why I chose uh, the title. It could, it does actually mean gifted in company, but you can also say it means gifted in operation. Like if a machine is, you can, uh, if it's working, then it's in bedrijf. Um, and so that's the double um, uh, meaning of my company's name. And yes, I work there with uh, now almost 20 colleagues where we provide services for gifted adults who, like myself, often are late identifiers. And I will talk about that group uh, a bit more in a few minutes. So, how are they doing? Gifted adults, again, in this context where I come from. Um, the founders of this Gifted Adults Foundation had a very important meeting in the year 2009 with um, a government agency in the Netherlands and they made a presentation for them to show them how gifted adults are doing. Um, they made an educated guess, so I want to emphasize that the figures I'm about to show is not based on scientific research, but it's an educated guess by three specialists about what they see happening in the Netherlands at that time um, with the lives of gifted adults. Um, yeah, and in that meeting, they all um, tried to get funding of this new foundation started. So there was a PR function behind the story, but still, um, it will give you an idea of what they saw, and that was also mainly within the Mensa population, because the two uh, persons I just mentioned, or all three of them actually that went to that meeting, are also members of Mensa in the Netherlands. Oh, I like how these colors turned out. Um, so, what they said is that about 30 to 50 percent of the gifted adults population in the Netherlands that did not have any gifted education are just doing fine. Um, they are happy, they are successful by whatever definition you want, um, but we see them in our corporate environments, in uh, politics, in the arts, musicians, um, you can see them everywhere. Even though they didn't have their, um, uh, the gifted education, they turned out just fine. But then, there are two other groups. And uh, first I want to start with uh, a, a portion of 20 to 35 percent, again, this is a guess, um, who were doing quite bad. They might be unemployed, homeless, lonely, where you see the words there on my slides, um, deal with addiction, maybe even uh, become criminal, and uh, suffer from mental or physical illness. And um, I'm sure that, we're, we are not sure that these percentages are still valid today, and I'm sure they are different for different kinds of countries. Um, but I, uh, with all the people I've spoken about this subject around the world, everybody can identify these three groups of gifted people. The middle group is the one that are doing so-so. Um, they do have jobs, um, but they are not making full use of their potential. They uh, might be what we uh, call underperforming, um, and, um, but they manage. Yeah? Um, but from a society point of view, it's unfortunate that society does not really benefit from their potential. And also, they themselves often are not really happy with their lives. And those are mainly my clients. So, like I said, the figures um, for other countries will probably differ. And, um, but we all, in all those different countries around the world, we hear 
uh, reports of part of the gifted population not being identified in childhood. I also know from research material uh, here in the US that, for instance, we see an overrepresentation of white boys in gifted education programs. So people from um, uh, girls are not there uh, as in the amount you would expect as a representation of the population. And the same for people with different social, economic, cultural, ethical, uh, ethnical uh, background. But what we see is that this identification is a, v a very big influence on their personal development process. And I think from a society point of view, you want to, early ident or to identify as early as possible to give them a good start and to make people um, strong enough to deal themselves with their special gifts and turning them into a meaningful life. So if I talk about the not so successful group, the mid group, um, the stories we hear about them is that they say, I've always felt different. Um, we tend to see they have a low self-esteem um, and I always compare that um, with how your own identity um, uh, starts. It's in the eye contact you have with other people. And if those other people are not your intellectual peers, what you get back in the eye contact um, is not always that positive. Um, I hear stories of uh, children being bullied because they were gifted. When they have eye contact with the children in their classroom who were not gifted, um, they don't feel understood. They also don't understand them. Um, and I always make the um, metaphor with the distorting mirrors. I was talking with uh, Ellen Fiedler about this yesterday at lunchtime. Um, you have these in the US in amusement parks as well. You call them house of mirrors, yeah? If you look at yourself in such a mirror, you get a distorted view of yourself. And this is often what happens when gifted children do not meet their peers. This is also one of the biggest benefits of gifted education, that we put those gifted kids together. And there, in their eye contact, there is confirmation, affirmation, validation, all important things somebody needs to get to, be, to get a clear and proper self-image. Not having had that, we hear from a lot of gifted adults um, that they suffer from this low esteem. And um, other things we hear, not having a meaningful life. Um, always, I hear a lot of people say, I know I can do better, I know I can achieve things, but I just don't know how. So are, they are not really able to manage all that potential that is inside, and they haven't learned how to bring it out uh, there. And another subject we see often is the difficulties in choosing, because we see many what we call multi-potentialites. I think there was even a question about it in the earlier talk. Um, and there's always some kind of pressure from society, you should choose that one passion you have. But not everybody has one passion. I know several people that are multi-passionate that are multi-talented, that are multi-potentialites. And um, choosing a career then can be really difficult. Other topics uh, we see a lot in this so-so uh, uh, group um, is perfectionism, fear of failure, procrastination, and they're often emotionally extremely intense. And just a quick check with this audience. Is anybody, can, can anybody relate to any of these points? 
Thank you. Like I said, yes, I'm from the Netherlands, and there's a cultural aspect in the way I was brought up in the world of giftedness, but we see these things all over the world. So when I'm talking about giftedness at work, this was the introduction, by the way. Let me take a sip of water. When we talk about gifted at work, I want to talk about four different items. So this is a structure slide, always helps me. Um, qualities, problems, skills they might want to improve, and specific needs they have. We have done several uh, scientific studies in the Netherlands, also in Flanders, in Belgium, where we share the same knowledge of the same language uh, with. And at the end of my presentation, I also give you um, uh, a literature uh, reference list with research that was also translated into English. Uh, so you can find that online. So if we look at the qualities gifted people bring to work, it's besides their intelligence, but it's their creativity. We see them as excellent problem solvers. Um, they show a lot of skills for innovation. Um, also, sometimes they bring solutions to problems where others don't even see the problem yet. <laughs> and I hear some recognition there as well. Um, and they are very good in making deep and thorough analysis of problems. So uh, what we see based, of course, on that uh, intellectual part, they can manage complex situations, but they can also visualize them and make them understandable for people with more average intelligence. Uh, and that is an extreme quality uh, we see in gifted people at work. But we also see problems. And um, on the number one, I've put conflict. Conflict at work. Uh, Nox Nauta, who I mentioned earlier, uh, is doing interesting research on that topic together with a colleague, Ido van der Waal. And they've also uh, published um, some articles uh, about this, but we see a lot of gifted people ended up in conflict, mainly with their boss. <laughs> and it is mostly about what you expect from a, a boss, what do you think he or she should be doing, and they are not. And you see that, and you might even see other things that your boss doesn't see. And then it really depends upon your boss how he will deal with you. I've met fantastic managers, really, who saw me and my gifted colleagues as an addition, as bringing something wonderful to them. But those were people who were standing firmly on the ground. They knew what, um, what, the, uh, what, what their purpose in life is, so they were not really insecure uh, people, and they tend to see other, or, or they tend to see gifted people as a richness, as, as something um, additional. However, if you have a manager who does not stand with both feet firmly on the ground, who is a bit insecure about his or her own functioning, then often gifted people or gifted colleagues are seen as a threat. And that's often when the conflicts start. Also, the type of conflict tends to be different. Um, they are much more colder, and often the gifted adult is very has strong principles and will not divert from that. And that is often a, a basis for conflict if two people can't meet each other. Another problem we see a lot, and I will um, discuss them together, 
bore out and burnout. Uh, I'm not sure bore out is also uh, already a familiar term here in the US. Yeah? No? No. Okay. You are familiar with the term burnout. Okay. It's when you work too hard on things that don't give you energy and then all your energy is away and you can't function properly anymore. Well, the same symptoms might occur if you're chronically understimulated. And that's what we call a bore out. So if your work is too simple, too easy, there's not an enough diversity, there's not enough intellectual challenge in it, and that maintains for a long while, we see people getting sick. They, uh, and then we call this a bore out. And although the symptoms from the outside world look the same, the way you get people back up and running is completely different. Because if somebody has a burnout, he really needs rest. He really needs to get that uh, nervous system calmed and then start building up slowly uh, uh, again. But if we see people with a bore out, we need to energize them as fast as we can with things that interest them, that put their spark uh, back on. Nice to be here in sparks, by the way. Uh, um, but that's the way you, how you can uh, leave a bore out, by doing the fun stuff that really gets you going. Another problem um, we see a lot is the need for meaning, uh, meaningful contribution to life or to your company and not being able to fulfill that. Uh, I see a lot of people that tend to have a connection or a loyalty towards bigger issues that might even supersede the scope of the company. Also, by the way, a possible area for conflict. And then there is the topic of loneliness. Um, we often call this existential loneliness. Not being understood, not understanding your colleagues, not knowing why they don't, why they don't see the purpose of this brilliant idea you have. Why don't they get it? And we tend to see uh, gifted adults in this problem area feeling really, really alone. Again, any recognition here? So what are the skills they mainly need to improve? Even, this is even um, so, uh, often true for the people in the high performing uh, category. Um, maybe because of the lack of gifted education, again, the context I come from, but self-knowledge uh, is often not very much developed in these people. And a second uh, topic is self-care. We see a strong relationship between in being intellectually gifted and the area of sensitivity and high sensitivity. There's a strong connection there. And we see that if you are highly, a highly sensitive person, you need to take care of yourself really well to be able to perform uh, well. So self-care and self-management are topics uh, I work on a lot with my clients. Another one is communication skills. If you are working with people that do not have the same speed of thinking as you do, and you need, sorry, I hear somebody laughing there uh, of recognition, and I feel yeah, your, this. Um, if you are unaware, and that's a topic I'll uh, uh, address in a minute, that you are gifted like I was for 33 years, um, you think, you take yourself as reference. 
you think, hey, if I can see that, anybody can see that, can't they? The answer is no, they can't. And it's not like they're not willing, what I always thought, um, it's they're not able to. And they are able, uh, at least in the environments where I worked, I did not work with dumb people. No, they were intelligent as well, just not quite as intelligent as I was, so there was a gap. Yeah? And um, what I found out is if I give them more time to process the information I give them, then they can come to exactly the same conclusions I can. Well, not everybody, okay, I'll be honest. But a lot of my colleagues uh, were able to do that. And so time sometimes really, um, uh, giving other people more time can help you to get them to understand you. So this also then comes down to cooperation skills. Are you, as a gifted person, willing to give other people more time? And what does it mean? And what do you do in the meantime? Because you don't want to get bored. Yeah? <laughs> We've already covered that problem. Um, um, so these are things I work, with, um, uh, I work on with my clients uh, in how they manage it themselves interpersonally, but also in connections then um, with others. And because conflicts arise so much, conflict resolution skills is also some, uh, something I work on with my clients. Because if you are better at preventing problems or preventing conflict, or by increased communication uh, skills, um, you can better, in the early stages of a conflict, cool it down, that's really, really helpful. So these are um, some examples of skills a lot of these gifted adults need to improve. And I see people nodding here. <laughs> then the needs. Uh, there's a beautiful study about that done as well. Several, actually. What are the needs of gifted people at work? And... Um, First, I want to start with a safe environment. Uh, I also mentioned an empathetic boss. Uh, so uh, if you work in employment, I come to the self-employment a bit later, um, then a safe environment for you to be allowed to be yourself is really, really very important. And just like we say for gifted kids, they need their peers, it's exactly the same for gifted adults. They want sparring partners. They want people with, on the same intellectual level, you can have nice talk with, you can together think about the problems you are trying uh, uh, to solve, and you want somebody with the same speed of thinking um, so you can have this wonderful interaction. Um, another need also described in the work people do with uh, gifted children in gifted education is autonomy. Um, autonomy is even in the Delphi model um, of giftedness um, that I also, um, the Mensa Research Journal, just the latest edition that got out today, yesterday, well, recently, um, I've wrote an article on there as well, um, uh, and I've, I've mentioned the Delphi model uh, in there, and autonomy is uh, being seen as one of uh, the main characteristics of gifted adults. Well, no, of gifted people, children as well. They want to find out things themselves, they want to do things in their own way, and if you're, for instance, in a management position and you have a gifted uh, employee in your team, the advice always is give them space and room and safety and let them do their thing. So autonomy is very important need of gifted people at work. If you are being micromanaged by somebody constantly looking over your shoulder, you will not perform at your best. Any recognition there? <laughs> yeah. 
Another need, diversity in tasks and also complexity in tasks. We don't like doing the easy stuff. We like the puzzles. We like the logical thinking too. Um, and what I, we also see a lot in the needs of gifted people at work is that they want to grow. Not necessarily in the vertical direction, going higher and higher and higher in um, the hierarchy, um, but from their personal growth point of view. They want to improve themselves. And often they do that at a very different pace than their colleagues. So also from a talent management point of view that a lot of companies have, like I was identified as a high potential within Ericsson. Um, also we see gifted people going through those talent development programs in work way faster than other talented colleagues. Um, so that is also recognized as a very uh, important need to be able to be allowed to grow in your own pace. Then a bit about the gifted careers. Um, David um, already uh, mentioned a few things um, about if you want to go for one area, please do. But I also see a lot of people with a very broad interest. And um, there's actually a study in the Netherlands that showed that gifted people who are uh, self-employed have higher job satisfaction. And we can mainly contribute that to the fact that they can manage their autonomy, the divi diversity and complexity of their work themselves. But not everybody can or wants to be um, their own master or their own boss. Um, so what we see happening a lot uh, with people that work in employment is that they are job hopping. They are moving from uh, to different companies, different jobs, sometimes even completely different fields. Um, and then you have the wonderful expression as a jack of all trades and a master in none. Um, I was a job hopper myself, but I worked for 16 years at the same employer. And there was such a large company, I was uh, able to job hop within the company. So on my resume, it looks really solid. Oh, well, 16 years at the same employer. But believe me, I had at least 17 different jobs in those 16 years. Um, so what I often tell to my clients, you need to look at your career as a necklace with beads. And each project or job or interest um, you want to add there is a single bead you can add um, to um, the strat. And some people are even um, that multi-skilled, multi-potentialite, multi-passionate that they need necklaces with multiple strands. So I know a lot of people, and I, I'm actually an example of that myself. For a long time, I worked in employment, had my own company next to it, and was the chair of a, quite a large foundation. And with having these three careers next to each other, I was able to express all this energy and interest and things I want to express. Um, and we see a lot of that. Uh, in the gifted population, again, in the Netherlands and Belgium. Um, and it's also perfectly fine if you can do this just in one special, uh, specialty. Um, but this is what we see a lot. How am I for time? Just checking with... Wonderful. Last year I turned 50, and that was quite an event for me. It was kind of like a milestone. 
So I decided to write a book, a book of my years of work uh, with gifted adults. And when I got invited to this colloquium, um, I thought, hey, an English translation would be really nice. And that actually got out only a few weeks ago. Um, I've got some copies here. Uh, heavy luggage on the airplane is quite expensive, so I didn't bring that many, but it can be ordered online. It's giftednessinpractice.com. Uh, you can find uh, how you can order it uh, there. Um, and in this book, you can see on the diagram on the left, I described what I do with my clients. And it's kind of like um, a process or a program um, I co-create mainly with my clients, depending on their needs. And when I zoomed out, I saw this process, this is what I do with my clients. So some of them come in and they still need to recognize their giftedness themselves. The, uh, another educated guess is that within the Netherlands, about 50% of the gifted adults are unaware of their giftedness. Uh, um, there are, uh, um, they more and more are uh, uh, identified or identify themselves because there is more knowledge about gifted children today. They start reading about their gifted child and then think, hmm, this also concerns me. And um, that is actually the main reason how gifted adults today in the Netherlands identify themselves as a gifted adult. And what we see happening then is if that occurs is that they um, really um, have this amount of motivation, intrinsic motivation um, that wants to get out and they want to they want to develop themselves and make up for uh, opportunities missed in the past. So, um, the first phase or stage in my coaching, if applicable, because there are people coming in who know they are gifted for a number of years, but also a lot of my clients don't know or aren't sure and have the question, how can I be how, how can I know that I am? Is, uh, do, I, do I need to take an IQ test? What's probably one of the um, main asked questions. I always say no, for me that's not required, but if you think that can help you, please do. And of course I point them to Mensa uh, then. Um, but once they identify themselves as gifted, and I use those words specifically in this way, because I still think being gifted is somebody you decide about yourself, even if you like it to be validated by somebody else, but still it's an internal process, in my opinion. So after this recognition, uh, recognition stage, we talk about what is normal for gifted people. And we actually, because if you are part of this minority, you differ a lot from average people, um, but amongst the group of gifted uh, people, we of course see a lot of common th things, themes, characteristics. And once they learn, so I call this psychoeducation, once they learn more about giftedness, they learn more about themselves. And some things they thought were awful about themselves suddenly are just the other side of uh, a medal. Uh, it's the, 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 the other side actually of something quite positive. Only they never looked at it that way and they never experienced it that way. So after normalizing what is giftedness uh, and how it, um, because you know that here within Mensa as well, put 300 gifted people in line. They are 300 different people, different individuals. Uh, so even though we have these characteristics of giftedness, they look different in each individual person. And that is also what I do in my coaching programs with my clients. How does it look for you, for you as an individual? And what do you want to do uh, with it? Then comes the stage of processing. Um, we see that late identification 
of being gifted um, kind of look like a mourning process. Um, a lot of people actually feel hurt. Why didn't we know this when I was a child? Why didn't they help me get through the boring stuff? Uh, why uh, did nobody ever tell me that I was a smart kid? So there's quite some pain uh, there. And um, I'm a coach, so I'm not a licensed psychotherapist or psychologist, but sometimes my clients need to have a separate track with a psychotherapist or psychologist to deal with that hurt. Um, and they really require that before they are able to well, unleash their potential. Um, so sometimes those two things go hand in hand. And then we get to the growing uh, uh, part. That's where uh, they learn those new skills uh, uh, I mentioned. And um, their um, uh, self-esteem and their um, they, they, they grow as a person, um, also in their confidence. And that often has consequences at work. And other people might see that, might encourage that. Sometimes the environment, which is my chapter six, which is uh, the whole box uh, around uh, this picture, uh, sometimes the environment doesn't really help in this process. Um, I've seen people finding new life partners when they became, for instance, a, a, a member of Mensa, but I've also seen marriages uh, break up because one of the partners um, identified uh, him or herself as gifted. Then this process um, uh, started and they did something within the relationship. Uh, but this, it is a process of growth. And the next stage, of course, is then to put these new developed skills with this new self-image. Uh, so I had a client who said it, I'm the 2.0 version of myself now. And um, she, uh, then you start uh, want to put this new stuff in practice. So it's the using of the skills, of the potential. I have a lot of clients, uh, the ones like I did, that dropped out of university that go back. And now that I know that I'm gifted, and now that I know what I didn't know before, I'm going to make it work. And I'm going to make it work for myself. Because as you, I don't know if you can really read it, um, but the subtitle of my book is Strengthening Personal Leadership in Gifted Adults. And that's mainly what I do. Um, I already discussed the environment. The, um, that's where we see a giftedness happening in a lot of families, going back generations, but also um, uh, towards uh, uh, children. Uh, I even have grandparents that identified themselves as gifted because the grandchild today was identified in school as a gifted child. And then you, I, I think my oldest late identifier um, was 76 years old when he identified as a gifted man. And that was actually established uh, by a neurologist in the hospital who took half of an IQ test for him because he wanted to know some brain functions. And I said, this is incredible, but you score in the top 2% of the population. And you're 76, did you know this? And no, he didn't. Um, he died, unfortunately, two years ago. Very sorry, uh, when I think of him, uh, it always makes me emotional. Um, so the seventh stage, um, as a coach, I always love to walk uh, besides my clients um, for a period of time, but they need to continue without me. So I have to make myself obsolete in their lives, and the best way I know how to do that is to make sure they can manage themselves. Um, Dabrowski, a uh, Polish psychologist, uh, psychiatrist uh, from uh, the previous century, uh, he talks about autotherapy, and I just love that uh, term, 
uh, and that's what I also try to do with my uh, clients, make them aware um, of how they can manage themselves and then they can continue doing that without my help. Some clients do come back after several years, after a few months, um, but then they often have new coaching questions uh, that they run into because they w were growing and they were using and are now working, living on a different level. That's mainly how they perceive it. And in that new world for them comes new uh, opportunities, uh, but also maybe new problems. And then uh, they like to come back to me uh, to deal with that. But then uh, in the process of growth, they're on a higher level in how they are evolving their potential. Um, and what I also say uh, in this last stage, so what I do in my work with gifted adults is we over, um, looking for a word here now, we overemphasize the aspect of giftedness in their identity because they need to integrate it in their personality. But I always tell my clients, you are lots more than just gifted. There are all kinds of different um, personality traits and things that make you a human being. But if you grow up in life without knowing this part of giftedness about yourself, uh, we see that a big part of the gifted population has problems with that. Um, so in my coaching programs, we over uh, emphasize the topic of giftedness temporarily, but then hopefully to let it go and work beyond the label um, because you are so much more uh, than just gifted. And uh, that is what I hope and wish for every gifted adult, that even though it's a big and an important part of your identity, you're more than that. I always say to uh, members of Mensa in the Netherlands, you're more than your IQ number. And please don't forget that. <laughs> so these are the key references uh, I talked about of the uh, scientific work that has been published in English. Um, I know uh, uh, handouts of these uh, presentations will be made available uh, to you, but I already see some people taking pictures. Uh, yes, please uh, have a look at that. And I think that that completes my talk and I'm open for questions. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you're open for questions and we already have them. Uh, those in the room, if you want to come up to the microphone, but we're going to start out. We already have several questions that have come in on the, uh, the live stream and I'm going to pass the microphone to Joy to relay those questions. Thank you. In your initial slides, you showed a group that was doing so-so. While I don't think it matters if people live up to their potential, if they choose something to do they love, if people are unhappy and not managing to be successful or manage emotions, perhaps a proportion of them are actually twice exceptional and actually lack executive functioning skills to do well on jobs. What are your thoughts? Hmm. Um, I absolutely don't mind if somebody chooses a profession that others might consider um, beyond their potential, if that's your personal choice. But I would like that personal choice to be based upon a clear picture of who you are. And if you don't really know who you are and you make that decision on a false assumption, because I can tell you a lot of my intelligent clients grew up thinking they were stupid. And if that decision is based on that, I still think it's their own individual process if they want to stay there or not. But at least now, with the knowledge we have about gifted adults, they have a choice. And I've known several people um, that then want to stay in the job they have because it's also quite comfortable. And no, no, not everybody wants 
to fulfill their potential to the fullest. And I don't have an opinion about that, whether that's good or bad. I just want the people that did not have the chance in childhood to make up for that. Then the other part of this question is about twice exceptional and executive functioning. And oh yeah, I work a lot with my clients on uh, executive functions. Um, and this is what I call managing yourself. Um, because if you as a gifted child were not um, challenged with things beyond your horizon and all the tasks in school you um, were put in that were put in front of you you can easily do them um, um, without proper thinking about it because you just instantly see it then there are then then there are some um, strategies you don't learn as a child that you might need as an adult. Because in your adult life, you will face many issues that will be beyond your horizon of what your intelligence can foresee. And if you have not developed those skills in dealing with the unknown and with uncertain uh, things, um, then yeah, that's a part of executive uh, functions as well that I train um, with, uh, as part of the skills uh, with my clients. What, what instrument was used to identify your high potential at Ericsson? Was this process implemented at recruitment and for all positions? Um, there was a question put out to all managers. Who of the people in your team do you think can grow fast? I think that was kind of uh, the way um, they asked the question. And then my manager appointed me and two colleagues. And then an IQ test actually was involved, but they never gave me the result. I only <laughs> know that, hey, you got in this high potential program within the company. It was years later that I found out, hey, they actually took an IQ test on me uh, at, uh, at that time. Uh, but mainly you had to be brought forward by your manager. So yeah, that was part of that. All right, hello. Um, my question is now, to my understanding, some parts of Western Europe, in particular, I'm thinking of France, where pre-adolescents are tested and identified and tracked um, to whether they're going to be going to vocational training, which they call college or university. Uh, so they have testing at a, at a very young age. Uh, is the Netherlands, are, are the Netherlands different? They don't, you're not tracked um, coming up as pre-adolescent, whether or not you're going to go to university or a trade school. And if you are, how do adults slip through the cracks? Mm. There is a form of testing, but it's mainly a knowledge test and not an IQ test. And that test uh, is taken, I think, with children um, uh, at the age of about 12 years old. Mm. Uh, and the results of that test, together with the advice of their teacher, then leads to uh, an advice of which next level of education they go to, uh, or they are allowed to go to after primary um, education. And um, there are a lot of people unhappy with uh, this system uh, because um, especially people with a different um, social, economical or ethnical background um, who you might call a late blossomer, uh, they uh, get identified, uh, they do not get identified then and get lower school advice than um, the kids that do perform well on that test. Um, so that's part of the Dutch uh, uh, system um, that has a lot of advantages, but also a lot of disadvantages, like any system I does, I suppose. Thank you. 
Okay. I know um, some adults who have children who are gifted, but are most parents who have gifted children also gifted, even if they don't know it? Um, yeah, w one of the things we know about intelligence is that uh, there is a hereditary part of it. Um, um, so yeah, often we see giftedness in families, in generations. But it's no guarantee that if two gifted adults put a child into this world, that the child will also be gifted. But often, yes, um, we, we, because of the hereditary part of intelligence, uh, we see this uh, uh, happening. But it's not a guarantee. So go talk to your parents now. No, just kidding. <laughs> and your grandparents. <laughs> Here's another from the chat. How do you attract gifted clients who don't identify themselves as gifted yet? Um, I get that question a lot. Um, um, if you as a gifted person recognize giftedness in another individual, then we often get the question, um, should I tell that person? Um, and my answer is yes, please do. Uh, you might be the first pointing it out, mm. and that person, it's new to that person, and they don't want to do anything with that information, but it might also be very well possible that you are for it, the third person saying that. And that might trigger something in that individual. But please leave it up to that individual, him or herself, what to do with uh, this information. But what we do is, uh, what we did with the um, Gifted Adults Foundation in the Netherlands is we build a website with a lot of information there, also connected to uh, Mensa uh, uh, in the Netherlands. There's a lot of information uh, uh, out there that help gifted uh, adults identify themselves. And again, quite a few are doing wonderfully in life, uh, but others uh, seek for guidance and help in dealing with this new information. Here's another from the chat. I enjoy visual aids and pictures, and especially those in your book, Giftedness in Practice. Can you please explain the value of the Delphi model of giftedness, for example? Which model, sorry? The Delphi model. The Delphi model, yeah. Um, May I refer to the Mensa <laughs> research journal that we be, will be out there, uh, I think, in lunchtime? Um, because I've uh, mentioned it in um, uh, that article, also with a reference to the article that is um, in here, which is not. Okay, I think I've missed one of my references. But it is in the Mensa research journal. There is a reference to an article uh, also then uh, uh, translated in English. It was published in the Advanced Development Journal, uh, which is issued by the Gifted Development uh, Center here in the US. Uh, Peer-reviewed uh, journal and the Delphi model is uh, explained in there. But I could talk for another hour if I were to explain that model here today. And even though we were ahead of schedule, uh, I'm not sure that would fit in. <laughs> so. Um, so, I have a question about uh, the pie chart that you described nicely, and um, it looks, uh, by listening to what you said, that a critical difference between the people who are successful and those who are so-so is probably about emotional intelligence. So, mm -hmm. my question is, do you measure, do you assess the uh, emotional intelligence level and probably areas of improvement of your clients. And I have a, just another question, if you don't mind to give an example of uh, one of your clients that you have helped and what was the outcome at work uh, that you, know, you could be proud of. Okay, thank you. Um, first, the issue of emotional intelligence. Yes, I work a lot with that concept. I am trained myself um, 
uh, to be able to administer the EQI 2.0 uh, test. Um, and when I do that, I do it twice. I do it in the beginning of the coaching program to get a baseline. And it uh, then helps me because this is a test that gives you in 15 different emotional skills your own self-evaluation. And then um, I discuss with my client on which of these emotional skills you want to work on. We work on them during uh, the program and at the end we do a second uh, uh, test to see the difference. Uh, and that's mainly a difference in self-perception because it is a self-evaluation test. And, um, but yeah, dealing with intense emotions, frustrations, um, also the topic of emotional self-awareness are uh, topics I work with uh, uh, a lot. Yeah. Then your second question, uh, a colleague or a client um, that I'm proud of, I'm proud of all my clients. And um, mainly because they have the courage to deal with this and to change their self-image. And that can be quite threatening, and it can be really difficult, and it can be scary. Um, so I'm proud of all my clients who take that step and want to engage that with themselves. But if I look at output or outcome, I've had some clients changing jobs, starting their own companies, uh, taking promotions, where others already thought they could do it, but they didn't believe that themselves. And after a coaching program with me, they had enough self-confidence to take that step. Um, oh man, I can give you hundreds of examples. Um, <clears throat> I want to be very mindful of time. Um, we've got like multiple people in the room standing. We also have multiple questions online. What we may need to do is after a, a few more here from in the room, we may need to take some of the other questions to the Q&A this afternoon, but we want to make sure that we're respectful of the people who are asking questions. I'm going to take one from over there. That'd be you, Dave. Thank you, Shirley. You've been talking to us about uh, uh, giftedness in the workplace and some of the challenges of socialization and how they may be uh, met. Uh, here in Mensa, it's uh, more of a play space, but it's very similar to a workplace, except instead of bosses, we're all peers, supposedly so. So in the workplace, <clears throat> we have, um, uh, we face very often a problem with, um, you mentioned, where bosses may feel threatened by some of us who are more intelligent. And it's like a we-they sort of thing, um, where there's a, a threat because people are different. But I see the same thing happening here in Mensa as well. Maybe it's in the nature of the human condition to have we's and they's. But um, there seems to be a, a growing uh, lack of tolerance for those who are different in their socialization, uh, particularly those who are 2E, and uh, some of whom, and not, certainly not all of whom, but some of whom um, have difficulty um, adjusting to the norms that people seem nowadays to expect of others, and uh, um, we're finding more and more conflict in this area. Uh, I'm wondering if anyone is studying the socialization of twice exceptional adults. So there's quite a lot being done on children, but of socialization of twice exceptional adults, both in the heterogeneous community and even among their intellectual peers. I would love a study about that. I am not aware any is taking place. So I don't think there is a study about this. Um, but it would be very interesting, I agree. 
So sorry, I can't help you. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot more research, by the way, we need to get done on giftedness in adults. And while I'm here <laughs> on the podium, I'm taking a, a minute to address that as well. Uh, getting money for uh, research about giftedness in children, at least in Europe, is already quite difficult. But man, it's way more difficult to get funding for proper scientific research about giftedness in adults. But okay. uh, one of the things, uh, this, this speaks to me a lot, okay, because by degree, I'm an electrical engineer, okay, which makes me a minority in my profession. Okay, one of the things I haven't heard a lot about is something called aptitude testing, okay? Um, and that actually provided for me the key of career satisfaction because I was tested by Johnson O'Connor Research. Okay, uh, but the thing that was interesting is that for 14 years, I worked in engineering, and probably only maybe about two or three years was I really satisfied. I was going into my third company and was tested by them at the insistence of my father, who was very supportive. The first, uh, this is not just uh, like one day worth of testing or just a few things. This was quite extensive, and the first words out of the man's mouth after they did all the testing, he said, you're very fortunate, because I still remember this, he said, you're very fortunate, you've got the education you needed for the aptitude you have. My problem was I was in the right profession, I was in the wrong job, okay? I needed to change in engineering to go into more a project type job, which meant that I stayed in my profession. I became a jack of all trades within power engineering. Okay. But I was also dealing with people, dealing with schedules, dealing with all the complexities. And so that's one of the things I'm seeing is I'm, I'm not hearing about, you know, proper aptitude testing because sometimes that can provide the key for that job satisfaction. Yeah. Okay, which it did. I completed a 40-year career in engineering. So that's one of the things I guess I'm wondering about with what you've got is that are, is aptitude testing being looked at? Yeah. Um, I work with a Belgian uh, method, it's called the Core Talents Analysis, and uh, I do that analysis with all my clients. Uh, it's about 23 different uh, talents where you can be either, uh, it can be one of your small talents, middle or strong talents, and I use that test to personalize the way an individual is gifted. And what we do, and there are a lot of people uh, in Belgium and the Netherlands trained in this method uh, that also work with gifted adults, like the 20 people I work with in my company are all um, uh, recognized core talents analysts. And um, that aptitude test is actually, or that assessment uh, a tool, uh, is actually the basis of my coaching program. But since it's so such a specific method and unavailable here, I did not really include it in my talk. Yeah, But uh, it's something I work with because, like I said, each gifted individual is so different from another. And with this test or this assessment tool, I can describe for my client, but also for myself as uh, <laughs> their coach, um, because what, what we want is that 70 to 80, well, hopefully 90% of their strong 
uh, uh, core talents, they can meet in their job. So thank you for your question and for uh, my opportunity to address this because, yeah, I do use that, uh, an instrument like that as a foundation, mainly, of my work. Thank you. In my book, I describe about it a lot. So, yeah. Okay. Because that was one of the things they said, you need to use the aptitude you have. Exactly. Otherwise, it becomes an itch you can't scratch. Yeah. yeah. And it's job dissatisfaction if you're not addressing those aptitudes. Yeah. I talked earlier about burnout and boreout, and this analysis tool I work with explains that for my clients perfectly. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right, we've got time for one more question in person, and sir, I'll get your name so that you'll be able to ask your question in the afternoon Q&A session, but let's uh, wrap this one up from here. Um, as Dave mentioned earlier, uh, Mensa is largely a volunteer-run organization, and yet one of our biggest challenges is recruiting and retaining volunteers. So what advice do you have for our gifted adult leaders managing other gifted adults? <laughs> Inspire them, give them enough autonomy, um, don't be afraid that they might think of something you haven't thought of. Don't be threatened by that. Um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm somebody that really loves, because I've been in management positions myself, and I always thought it was my job, that's probably also why I became a coach, to let other people grow. And if you are able to do that, you will grow yourself as well. Um, so working with volunteers, I, find, I found it to be quite a challenge uh, because um, some people don't actually have the skills to work for a foundation, but they do have intrinsic motivation. And that's what you can always work with. Would that answer your question? Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rian. Obviously, your, your topic did resonate as we had many questions from many directions. Uh, I can't, given the, the level of interest that our speakers this morning have generated, I can't wait to see what happens this afternoon. Now, again, again, thank you very much. Um, a couple of housekeeping type announcements, um, if, if I could. One is that at least two of our presenters today do have books available at a table outside of this room, the, 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 the registration table. The, they do have their materials available there. Um, for those of you who are um, online in the live stream, we expect the program to resume at 1.30 p.m. Pacific time, so that's just over an hour and a half from now. Uh, for those of you who are here in person, there is lunch provided, and we are going to have a lunch along with an awards presentation at the lunch. For those of you who are capable of apparating through barriers, uh, lunch is right on the other side of that uh, uh, barrier. Uh, for, those, for the rest of us, we'll be going out the door and walking around to where there's an actual door into the room for lunch. We will see you all there. Thank you very much.